Okay, everyone, welcome to Router God CDP and Static Routing. This is for beginners, people going for CCNA. If you're going for CCNP, you will probably be bored. So just, uh, just a word of warning for you guys. Uh, this is also being recorded, so you can watch this on YouTube later on. So just have your JNS3 up and running. Also on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a group chat window. Just go ahead and click in there, type... Uh, type test or just to make sure that it works. So John already has his GNS3 up. And also go ahead and share your screen if you haven't done so already. So click on screen share on the left hand side and then click on the appropriate monitor or application. That way we can see your screen and see what you're doing. Yeah, I won't be back for long. I've got uh, two months overseas coming up. Nice, congrats. So Jim just posted that he passed his CCNP switch test. You, so question is, can you guys, can you follow by doing packet tracer? You can. Um, it'll look different, but it's possible. Okay, so we're going to build a simple topology with, uh, let's do three routers, three routers in a triangle. Then we'll fire them up, and then we'll start with CDP, and then we'll go into static routing. I don't expect to spend too much time on CDP, but it is one of your most important troubleshooting tools that you'll have. Uh, so main thing is knowing how to turn it on, turn it off, and then knowing the output inside of uh, the different show commands in there. So let's delete that. So if you're running the new GNS3, you'll see on the left hand side, you've got your uh, icons here, you've got routers. If you click on that, you'll get the, the list of routers. Hopefully you're using the 3725 image, so drag in, drag in the image. Whoa, maybe I don't have my image set up. Look at that. Okay, just hang on for a second. That's why we're doing this live, so we can run into problems like this, but that's okay. Because I have a router image here somewhere. Dropbox is a wonderful thing. Man, I've got to clean up my desktop. I can't find anything on this. There we go, got one. Okay, so you're seeing me configure the iOS images and hypervisors. Um, let me just zoom in here. Whoops. So, 3725 Advanced Enterprise K9 that gets you the IPv6 encryption and uh, advanced routing protocols like BGP and uh, OSPF. 3725 and that default RAM of 128, I always up this to 256 because if you're going for CCNP and CCIE, you're going to want that memory to be up so that NAT will not blow up. So I'll close that. And so now, I'll be able to click here and drag stuff in here. And so we're going to drag in three routers like that and then get rid of your uh, pop-up window right there. And if you use your scroll wheel, you should be able to scroll in. So let's make a triangle. Router 1 left hand side, router 2 up top, and router 3 on the right side. Uh, so Festus has a question, if you don't have the 3725 image, can you use the 3600? Yes, you can, but if you read the FAQ, you really should have the 3725 image. A lot of the topologies will blow up later on if you don't have the 3725. So that's why it's recommended in the FAQ. Okay, now we're going to link them together. At the top, you're going to see a... Oh, no. They put it on the left-hand side now. I'm used to going up here to do the link. On the left-hand side, you'll have an icon that says Add a Link. Click on that. Your cursor turns into a cross, crosshairs. Click on R1 and select Fast00, F00. So this is your first fast Ethernet slot. Click on R2, click on him, fast zero zero. 
Click again on R2, it's going to be FAST00, go down to R3, FAST00, and then R1 to R3. You only have one interface left on each one of those, so it's going to be uh, FAST01 to FAST01. And don't forget to go over here, back to the left-hand side, unclick or click again on that add a link, just so your cursor isn't in the crosshairs. And what you might want to do is go up here to this icon up here, show interface labels. That guy right there. Yeah, look at that. Okay. <laughs> That icon right there, just click on that and you'll get your interface labels. And you can move them around a little bit just to make sure they don't get too confusing. So there you go, three routers in a triangle. Nothing's turned on yet because you see there's uh, red dots here. And we turn them on by going up here, click on that play button, green triangle. That guy right there and you'll see your interface icons or your status indicators have turned green and now you can console into everything click on this console button console to all devices and you should get multiple console windows popping up Now, as a, as a tip, um, let me set my idle PC first. Really, you should only set your idle PC running one image or one router at a time. So I'm kind of not doing this completely correct, but... Okay, so as a study tip, a lot of people ask, how do you, how should you arrange these, uh, these windows? And the way I like to arrange it is, if you, if you look at your topology, your topology is a triangle, right? So the way I arrange my, my windows, my text windows, is I will arrange it the same as the topology. That way, you don't get confused. So R1 in the bottom left, R2 at the top, and R3 in the bottom right. And then to change your uh, your font size, just right click. This is assuming you're using PuTTY. Just go to Change Settings, and then go to Appearance. Right by Font Change, and I usually like like uh, Consolus, and then we'll do like a 20 point font. Oh Jesus! Okay, let's change that. 20 point is a bit too crazy. Let's do 14. Okay, 14 is not too bad. I think I'll go 16 for here. Yeah, 16 is a little bit better because I'm running a 1920 by 1200 resolution on this uh, this external monitor here. Also, as a tip for you guys, if because uh, you know, it's going to take me a while to do this, if you're looking for a second monitor, I just bought one from uh, Monoprice. Uh, in no way are we sponsored by Monoprice, but uh, they had a sale on uh, an IPS panel, 27 inch, 2560 by 1440 resolution, 390 bucks. So I just got it. Uh, it's the same panel that Apple uses in their Mac Pro desktop, and uh, it's, Pretty awesome display for 390 bucks, and uh, no dead pixels. So I was kind of concerned about that for 390, but everything seemed to work out work out well. Okay, so we've got all of our routers up and running: R2, R1, R2, R3. Anyone having any trouble uh, getting the console windows up on their routers? So go ahead and mute your mic, please. Okay, any problems getting console windows up? If you have problems, just click or type in the chat window.
Okay, for the idle PC, uh, we've got a video on that, but basically you should, uh, once you set it, it's done for all your routers. And you only need to set your idle PC once with one router up and running. So what you saw me do with doing it with three routers running, that's not exactly correct, but uh, you know, it was a quick and dirty thing without having to restart GNS3. Uh, the new GNS3, the RC3, I believe, uh, does a pretty good job in finding the idle PC value. Okay, so let's go on router one. Router one is up and running. And basic thing you should do when you go to a router and you don't know anything about it, you should probably see if your interfaces are up or down, right? You also want to see IP addresses of your interfaces. So show IP int br, show IP interface brief. That will show you that your two interfaces, 00 and 01, are down, administratively down. Now there's a difference between admin down and down. Administratively down means they are actually shut down. So if you look at your running config, so type in show run, and you hit space to hit go by page by page. And if we scroll up, you'll see that interface fast zero zero is in shutdown mode. Right here. So shutdown mode. Now there's a difference between a router and a switch. So a Cisco router versus a Cisco switch. In a Cisco router, the interfaces are shut down by default. On a Cisco switch, interfaces are on by default. So it's a little opposite um, thinking there. And it kind of makes sense because when you think about a switch, you pretty much are thinking that you just plug it in and it kind of works. You should be able to see lights right away. So first thing we want to do is we want to turn on those interfaces and we want to go into conf t, we want to go into configure mode. The t means terminal. So conf t. We want to go into the interface itself. So int stands for interface fast zero zero. That's going to drop you into interface mode. So whatever commands you type here are going to be stuck on that interface. So the command to shut down an interface is shut down or shut for short. If you want to turn it on, it's the opposite of that. So it's going to be no shut. You'll see this no quite a bit. So you type in no shut there. Do the same thing on interface fast zero one. And you don't need to type in no shut, just hit the up arrow a couple times to get back your last commands. And then type, uh, it'll go to no shut and then just hit enter. And it'll save you on your typing. And you see these console messages are coming up. Now if we type in end, it will come back to the enable prompt. And now if you hit the up arrow, couple times you'll get back to show IP interface brief. And now you can see status is up and up. Now this isn't exactly correct. This is more of a GNS3 thing. Uh, in real life, it wouldn't necessarily be up and up because the other side is still down but in GNS3, it's up and up. Now this hitting up of the up arrow, so when you hit up arrow, you get uh, the last, last commands. This is known as your history. So this is your trivia question here. How many of you know what the default number of commands is that your router will save? Ten, correct. 
So Festus says, or Festus is asking, in real time, the protocol is supposed to be down. Yes. In real life, this would be down because the other side has not been up yet. Correct. So the history size is 10. If you want to look at your history, it's pretty easy. Show history. Show history will show your last uh, bunch of commands. And then you can change your history size if you want, like uh, sometimes I like changing it to 100. But you can change it to whatever you want. 10 is usually fine. All right, so actually to change the history size, someone just messaged me on that. Go back to R1, go into conf T, and we have to go to configure the console, so it's line con zero, line console zero, and I think it's history size, okay, go figure, history size, 256, max it out. So now it will remember up to 256 um, commands there. So you have to drop down to line console zero. So conf t line console zero history size 256. You can't see my screen. Uh, anyone else having problems seeing my screen? Do you have someone else's screen selected? Yeah, I think you probably just found the problem. So, <laughs> so along the bottom, just click there and okay so you'll figure it out okay let's go to R2 and we'll turn those interfaces on so conf T and in this one instead of going into the interfaces like interface fast 00 and fast 01 we're going to configure those two interfaces in one shot and this is a command you're going to see uh, quite often when you get into CCNP and CCIE, it's called interface range. Interface range. This lets you configure a bunch of interfaces in one shot. So you still have to do interface range fast zero zero. So that stays the same. Then on on these routers in GNS3, it's space dash and then a ending number. So what you want to do is you're telling the router, I want to configure everything from zero zero up to zero one and it's dependent on the spaces here so if you try to do that it's going to bomb out now on the updated routers the updated ios this will work but in the one that we're dealing with now you have to put the spaces so we have an open mic somewhere just check for an open mic Okay, found it. Okay, so interface range, fast zero, zero, space, dash, space one. And now whatever commands you type in are gonna hit everyone. So we're gonna do a no shut. And with the no shut there, both interfaces are gonna come up. Got an open mic. Jeff, open mic. All right, interface range, you've shut, no shut those. And staying on R2, just end out of there. And if you show IP interface brief, you'll see that you've got your two interfaces up. No IP addresses assigned just yet. But if you take a look at show CDP neighbors, you'll see that you definitely see R1. So this means that R1 is connected to your FAST00 interface. 
there's a hold time here of, it should be, let's see, 60 seconds times three, so it should be 180 seconds. So what a hold time is, is if you don't hear from the guy in 180 seconds, you're going to consider him to be dead. Capability here, RSI, router, switch, and it does a routing protocol. It tells you the platform, 3725, and it says on the other side, his port that's connecting to you is fast zero zero. Any questions with what we see here on show CDP neighbors? So you don't need an IP address for this to work. So the IP addresses could be totally jacked up. This will still work. Okay, so now let's put an IP address on R1's FAST00 interface. So we'll go to interface FAST00. It's already no shut, so we don't have to worry about the, whether it's on or off. And we're going to pop in an IP address, IP address 10, 10. And because it's in between router 1 and router 2, let's go 1010.12. That way when you look at that third spot you could say, oh okay, 12, well there's a 1 and a 2, so it's between routers 1 and 2. We like using this convention, it, it makes sense. Uh, later on we're going to do a link between routers 1 and 3, so it's going to be 13, and the link between routers 2 and 3 will be 23. And then this last octet we're going to make the IP address .1. And the subnet mask is going to be a slash 24, so 255.255.255.0. Enter. And now if you type in end and show IP interface brief, you'll see that that IP address is hooked on to your FAST00 interface. And even, be, even though on R2 we don't have an IP address, if I show CDP neighbor, that still works. If I show CDP neighbor and add the word detail to the end, you'll see that we've got, uh, let's see what here. Oh, it's probably still looking for an update. There we go. So show CDP neighbor detail, you'll see that it sees the IP address that's on the other side. So CDP is a very useful command if you're trying to figure out what IP to put on your side and you can't get to the other side, you can't go to R1, you can't physically console into R1, maybe you can't telnet into R1. Just uh, you know, take the cable from R1, pop it into R2, show CDP neighbor detail, and you should see the IP address on the other side. Is anyone else seeing uh, Festus uh, connect and disconnect? Okay, it's kind of annoying, but uh, okay. And you can guarantee that in your CCNA test, you will get at least a couple CDP questions. That's a guarantee. So. Okay, let's pop an IP address on R2. So R2, we'll go into FAST00. IP address 101012. 10, so we made the other side dot one. Probably good to make this side dot two. Doesn't have to be, but uh, we like to make things easy in here. You already no shut that interface. And so now if I end out of there, I should be able to ping 10101201. 10, 
and after that first one dies because of ARP, we have four successful replies. And if I hit the up arrow, I'll get five good replies. Okay, so, so far nothing too, too earth shattering on this. Now, how many of you have never done a loopback interface before? So you've never configured a loopback or maybe you don't know what a loopback is. Anyone in that category? Okay, so we're going to do one now. Nothing too mysterious. It is a fake interface, a virtual interface that you can set up on, um, I want to say all Cisco routers, maybe not all, but uh, probably everyone that I've played with. So it's kind of like on your, uh, on your computer, you can set up multiple IP addresses on your, on your computer. You can even set up loopback interfaces on uh, Microsoft Windows. This is the same concept. And we do it for several reasons. So we're going to set up a loopback on R2 just for kicks. And when we set up the loopback, you can almost think of it as being another link here, another Ethernet cable, another network. Right? So something connected to R2. From R2's perspective, it is another cable going out somewhere. But it's on its you know, it doesn't actually go anywhere for real, but R2 thinks um, thinks the loopback acts that way. So let's configure a loopback, very easy, very simple. It's going to be conft interface loopback. Now, if you just type in LO and hit tab, you'll see that it completes it for you loopback. But when you get really good, you just type in LO. And most people, it's LO0, zero is the first number you could use. Hit enter. So interface loopback zero. You'll see that this thing comes up right away because it's not actually attached anywhere. And we could give it an IP address. Let's give it an IP address of 8888. 255, 255, 255, 255. So that's a slash 32. Oop. Got to add in the word IP address. So IP address all eights, all 255s. If you're Asian, you know that this number is very, very lucky, and you will probably hit the lottery after typing this in. If you're not Asian, don't worry about it. Just laugh at us Asians for think believing that the number 8 is lucky. Okay, so we've got this loopback interface show IP interface brief. Your loopback is right there. Now, if you're an R2, you can definitely ping it because it's, it's right there, it's on your router, it is you, so you should be no problems pinging it. And this is where we get into static routing. So R2 can ping its own all eights address. If I go to R1 and I try to ping all eights, who is going to predict, who can predict what's going to happen here? Yes, it will fail. There's no route to it. We have no idea where it goes. So if I ping all eights, it's going to bomb out. Right. And control shift six to stop the ping because, you know, it's it's dumb. So when you're troubleshooting connectivity problems, so you try to ping it, doesn't work. The first thing you should probably do is show ARP. Do you actually have an ARP address for all eights? And you do not. You know how to get to 12.1, 12.2, but you have no clue how to get to 8888. 
If we take a look at your routes, show IP route, you'll see that the only guy you know how to get to is 101012. So here's what we see here. Let's go here, just move these over a bit. So your router one over here, you only know how to get to that side and that side. This is all you know about. Anything outside of this box, you don't know how to get to. So you're trying to get to this guy over here, which is 8888, and you have no clue how to get there. So we're going to fix that. We're actually going to make a static route that tells R1, hey, if you want to get to this spot right here, then I'm going to send you to a spot that you do know how to get to, and that's this dot to address right there. So for those of you guys on the West Coast, let's say you have never, you're trying to explain to someone how to get to, uh, let's say, Mormon country, right? Utah, right? Salt Lake City, right? I don't know. Maybe you want to see the birthplace of whoever that guy is who started the Mormon religion. So you want to go to Salt Lake City and, uh, or this person wants to go to Salt Lake City. You, you, uh, they don't know how to get there. So you're trying to explain it to them. And let's say this person is technologically illiterate. Well, the way you would do it is say, well, can you get to Las Vegas? Do you know how to get to Las Vegas? Yes, I know how to get to Las Vegas. Well, head towards Las Vegas. And after you hit Las Vegas, you're going to see signs telling you how to get to Salt Lake City and just take it from there. So a static route is basically saying to get to this unknown address, you're going to go to an address you already know about. And so we already know about everything in the 10, 10, 12 network. So we can ping 10, 10, 12, 2. We can get to that guy. So I'm going to make a static route that goes through 12.2. So conf t, this is on router 1. IP route. So we want to go to 8888. We're going to be very specific here. Just this address. And later on I'll tell you how to change this up a bit, but for now we just want to go to that particular guy. And we have a couple options here, but for now we're going to say if you want to go to all eights, you're going to do 10, 10, 12, 2. So to hit that address, hit 12.2. And now, if I show IP route, we should see a static route right over there. All eights. We have a 1 slash 0. I'll explain what that is later. But this right here is the important one. That is known as the next hop. So what your router does is it goes, okay, if I want to go to here, 8888, I'm going to look at how do I get to 10.10.12.2 and then it does a recursive lookup. It then jumps down to this guy right here. It says how do I get out of 10.10.12.2. It looks at this guy right here and it knows that it is going out fast 0.0. zero. All right, so it finds the next hop IP and then it finds the exit interface because it has to know what interface to chuck it out of. So explained a little further, you could say that if you're trying to go to Salt Lake City, you're going to look at going to Las Vegas first. And maybe the guy, okay, Las Vegas, how do I get to Las Vegas? I'm going to take the, I think it's the 15 freeway north, 
from Southern California. So this would be the IP addresses, the cities, and the actual freeway would be the interface. So this right here, the 15 freeway north, is like fast zero zero. Man, that guy Festus, he's having he's having some problems connecting. Yep, knew it. Festus, are you having uh, are you having some problems connecting and reconnecting? I see you're uh, you're logging on and off quite often. Okay, any questions about this recursive lookup right here? So pretty simple. It wants to go to all eights. It goes, okay, well, I'm going to need to hit 10, 10, 12, 2. How do, I, how do I hit 10, 10, 12, 2? Looking down here, I'm going out fast, 0, 0. So now if I ping all eights, let's see what we get. We get a success. So that's pretty awesome. And if I show ARP you'll see that uh, nothing too fancy right there. Okay, we've got some uh, proxy ARP going on there. Now if I debug IP packet, this is a debug that uh, in testing environments it's okay, but never ever, well, not never, but um, don't do this on a regular production environment without doing an access list or something like that, because you'll kill the router. But for now, debug IP packet. Hit the upper arrow a couple times and get uh, ping 8888. And you'll get the raw output right there. And to kill the, kill the debug, just do a U space all. It stands for undebug all. So let's examine this a little bit. Okay, the S means it's the source, so that's coming back. Okay, so we're seeing a source and destination. So let's see, in there you'll see source S equals 10, 10, 12, 1. So you're going out from your side. D stands for destination, you're trying to get to 8888. And you're going out of fast to zero, zero. That's in the parentheses right there. LEN stands for length in bytes, so 100, 100 bytes. And then the return traffic is where it's flipped. So source 8888 coming to you, 10, 10, 12, 1. And the received means it's you got it. Receiving and sending. All right. So I could make another loop back on R2. So if I go to back to R2 and make interface loop back uh, one, and let's make an IP address of all nines, 9999, 255, 255, 255, 255. So now I have a IP address of all nines. If I go back to R1 and I want to do a static route for that guy, what would my static route command be? So just go ahead and type it in the chat window if you know what that static route will be. Yep, you guys got it. IP route all nines, all two five fives, ten ten twelve two. So that's pretty good. So let's do that. IP route nine 
999 255 255 255 255 10 10 12 2 and now I should be able to ping all nines without a problem so don't discount static routes as uh, as a tool that you could use I use static routes uh, quite often both in troubleshooting you know fixing weird problems uh, and sometimes you just you just have to use them there's no way of escaping it so Christopher has a, a observation he says well this would also work IP route all nines all two five fives fast zero zero so that is available it doesn't work exactly the same so here's what I mean about that so when we set up this static route to go to all eights when we specify our next hop of 10 10 12 2 so we're when we do that we're actually telling the router to hit this guy exactly and then router 2 will take care of it from then on router 2 gets the hot potato if instead we say instead of sending it to the IP address we send it we want to do an exit interface it's a little different in the sense that R2 has to ARP for every address back here it's not really a big problem but it's not exactly correct so let's let's actually show you what I mean so if you go to R1 and let's say we do another static route let's do another static route I'm going to do IP route let's say uh, 5.5.5.0 and we'll make it a slash 24 so 255.255.255.0 and we're going to say go out fast 00, zero. so do that on R1 so what we're saying here is this is a little different we're not matching it exactly we're doing a slash 24 and so what this means is this you are saying that if you're trying to get to 555 1 chuck it out try to chuck it out fast 00, zero. if you're trying to go out 5552 five, five, chuck it out fast 00, zero. dot 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 five 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 dot two five four chuck it out fast zero zero right. that's what you're telling this router you're basically saying that last that fourth octet that fourth piece right there don't bother you know I don't care about that it can be anything so let's see what happens So I ping five 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 one and it's gonna bomb out. Now instead of waiting for the, the five failures here, what you could do is ping five 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 one repeat one and it just sends one byte. Right. Now if you hit up arrow, you go two up arrow three right they're all gonna fail because we don't actually have anything with this address but you get the picture right show ARP check that guy out So what's the difference here? Before we did a direct next hop, we didn't see anything in our ARP table. Here we see all these incomplete ARP requests. Your router tried to go to 5551, 5552, so on and so forth, and it's going to fill up your ARP table. 
So that's the main reason why we don't want to just chuck it out uh, fast zero zero. All right. Does that does that make sense? Why we don't want to just throw it out fast zero zero? Now, if you find a match, it works great. The problem is when you don't find an exact match. Now, in CCNA, you know, it's not going to matter. Fast zero zero will work just fine. It's when you get to CCNP and CCIE that uh, this will matter. But uh, the way we the way we run things here is we kind of assume that eventually you're going to go for CCIE, so I might as well just teach you that way anyways. Uh, go ahead, Festus. Okay, so Festus has a question. Let's say we have three routers connected. Okay, so his question is, you have a bunch of routers connected, you know the IP address of your side, but you don't know the IP address on the other side at the ISP end. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that would be called the ISP. Now, what you could do is you could ping a range of IPs, um, and you might just get lucky. So... What I would do is, let's say you go on your router. This is, I'm just gonna, not gonna spend too much time on this, but let's say your side is 65, 1, 1, uh, you know, 3, let's say. Most likely the, the next hop will be somewhere in these first two spots. So I would run a ping sweep on here and then here, if this didn't do, uh, if this didn't catch it. But, yeah. Okay, so on R1, if we show IP route, our routing table is getting kind of crazy. Well, it's not getting kind of crazy, but for a CCNA, it's getting kind of crazy because we've got three static routes here. And by the way, we could filter this because this is kind of is a little confusing sometimes to to read this. And the way it goes is these two lines are part of it, but you're only really concerned about these lines right there. So the way to filter this out is you'll notice that each one of the lines that you like that you want to see has an S in front of it, a capital S. So what you could do is this, you could do show IP route space, the pipe symbol. So the pipe symbol is shift and uh, if you look on your keyboard above enter, between enter and backspace, if you have like a normal keyboard, a Western keyboard, I guess, um, <laughs> that uh, slash, and if you hit shift and hit that key, it puts in a pipe, pipe I, it stands for include and capital S. Now let's see if lowercase s works. That's Oh, <laughs> don't do lowercase s uh, cuz it will give you all the lines with lowercase s. So Okay, so show IP route pipe i capital S shows you that, but it also shows you all this crap over here, right? So better way of doing it is show IP route static. Okay, it gets rid of all this junk up here, but we kind of have the same problem with the multiple lines there. So we have to do a combo. Show IP route static pipe I 
capital S. And now it's clean output right there. This is beyond uh, what CCNA really requires, but those of you guys who eventually are going for CCIE, you need to do this. You need to filter out output because if you're taking the lab and you're on the seventh hour mark, your brain is going to be destroyed. Yeah, the Nexus stuff is pretty good. Okay. Oh, also, uh, you know, if you guys have been following this stuff at Cisco Live, Cisco will launch their competitor to GNS3 uh, sometime later this summer. It has a stupid name. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what Cisco was uh, thinking about. The name of this thing is called Viral, Virtual Something Router or Something Lab. I think Virtual Instructional Routing Something Lab. Uh, supposedly it will be free. It is their uh, iOS on Linux, and uh, you know it's not completely done yet. It bombs out on on Ethernet, <laughs> so uh, yeah, some people tested it at uh, Cisco Live, and apparently they were telling them to only use serial interfaces because the Ethernet doesn't exactly work, which to me boggles the mind. But uh, this supposedly will be launched for free, and uh, you know it's what they're working on. Uh, they they really should have just bought GNS3. But, you know, it's Cisco. They do weird things sometimes. Yeah, I know. It would have saved them, like, all this trouble. Okay. So putting on in all these static addresses is really dumb. Really, really dumb. So let's do this. We'll do another static route, and we call this the Hail Mary static route because it's a, it sends everything that you don't know about out that interface. So we call this, the technical name for it is called a default route. And the way to do this, very easy, very simple. It's IP route, all zeros. So it's four zeros, four zeros. And then we're going to say next top of 10, 10, 12, 2. So send everything I don't know about out 10, 10, 12, 2. So essentially what you're doing is you're making the traffic flow go this way. You're just saying, you know what, if I don't know exactly where to send it, send it to dot two over here, router two. And then he'll take care of it as well. Now the misconception here is that your router will send all traffic to router 2. This is not exactly correct. It will send all traffic that it doesn't know how to get to out router 2. If it knows how to get to something else over here in router 3, like it knows a better route, it's still going to chuck stuff out to router 3. So default route means it's a, a route of last resort. It's kind of like this. So let's say you have a girl out there called uh, Mary. No, Mary's a bad name. Susan. OK, so Susan is a very attractive girl. Uh, she has a list of phone numbers of a bunch of guys. And uh, you know she wants to go out on Friday night. So she starts going through her list of uh, people, right? So there's like Eric and Michael and Bob and Joe. And uh, down here at the very bottom is a guy called uh, Paul. <laughs> uh, okay, so Paul's at the bottom. Now, Paul is uh, not the greatest guy in the world, uh, you know, very abrasive. I'm, you know, I'm just pulling this name out, not really picking on anyone. So, uh, so Susan wants to, you know, wants to have fun on Friday night, wants to go to a party or whatever, uh, dance floor, you know, a club. 
So she starts going through these names. She calls Eric first. Eric is washing his cat. She calls Michael. Michael is, uh, you know, I don't know what Michael is doing, but doesn't answer. Then she calls Bob. Bob is watching Superman. Hey, Superman takes precedence over Susan. Calls Joe. And Joe doesn't answer. And then finally, you know, she didn't really want to call Paul, but Paul's the last number on her phone list. And uh, Paul answers. So Paul down here is the default route. It means that if all else fails, you're going to get the last the last person the last you know you're going to go to router 2 All right so router 2 if you don't know how to get there another way you're going to go hit router 2 okay now let's go on router 2 let's set a default route there and you can see what trouble we can possibly get into with default routes. And you guys can probably understand where I'm headed with this. On router 2, if we do IP route, all zeros, all zeros, let's send it back to router 1, 10, 10, 12, 1. So now what's happening here is... We have a default route on router 1 that chucks stuff that way. And we have a default route on router 2 chucking stuff back to router 1. What's the problem with this? What's a potential thing that can happen? Yeah, that's a loop. It's a loop when you're trying to hit a, an IP address that you don't know about. So if we go on router 1, go back on router 1, and let's ping an IP address that we don't know about. So uh, 10, 10, 10, 10. It's not going to work. And you can control shift 6 to uh, kill that. And you can see that it hit 10, 10, 12, 2. It came back to you, 10, 10, 12, 1. And now it's just going back and forth. And, uh, you know, it's it's not not a good thing. I wonder if we could see this. If I debug IP packet and do a ping. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's just awesome, right? Okay, and then finally the ping just goes, nope, not going to happen. Now, don't necessarily get scared of a default route. If you only have one connection out, it's not a big deal. So if you look like, uh, let's say you've got... Uh, you bought a Best Buy special, I don't know, is it still called Linksys? I think it still is. And you connect this to your DSL line, cable line, Fios, whatever, and this goes out to the internet. It's perfectly fine to have a default route pointing out that way. All right? Perfectly fine, not a problem. In fact, uh, in my early days of network engineering, when you're going to like uh, people's houses to help set up stuff or small businesses, you you hear have a lot of complaints about I can't reach the internet. Well, you can't reach the internet because you can't have a you don't have a default route going somewhere. That's one of the most common things you you see. Right. So that that happens more than you really want to uh, <laughs> acknowledge. Also, you run into situations where uh, a default route can get you into interesting scenario. So I'll show you what we have at work. So at work, we have a distribution switch, uh, 6509. 
It's connected to multiple firewalls. Whoa. Like it connects to a whole bunch of crap all right? FortiGate. FortiGate. Actually, pretty decent firewalls. FortiGate, three FortiGate firewalls, and a Cisco ASA. You have internet connections coming in all three. And then you have multiple links going out to your servers. So, you know, the typical Dell, you know, Dell farm. Lots of Dells, lots of NetApps. You get the picture. So on this distribution switch, there's a default route pointing to, I think it's, you know, this FortiGate dot three. So the problem with this is that if this particular link dies and you have that default route pointing out that side, you're, you're dead in the water. So it's happened that way. But it's not too bad because it's predictable. You know that when it fails, this will happen. But, you know, you run into situations where having multiple links and, you know, well, you got to point a default route out somewhere. So might as well, might as well be dot three. And you're probably going to have default route troubleshooting and static route troubleshooting in your CCNA exam. Definitely. All right, let's go back to R1. Let's make a loopback on R1. Interface loopback zero. Let's give an IP address of all sevens here and make it a slash 32 again. So we know that we can ping all eights. Not a problem. All right, whoa, turn off that debug here. Now we can change this ping. So I want to ping all eights, but I want the ping to start at something else, start at a different interface. And so we could say start from loopback zero. So you're going to start it from loopback zero and the ping has to respond all the way back to loopback zero. So visually it's going to look like this. So at R1 we have a loopback, it's just like another link here. And on R2 we have a loopback, just like another link. And we're sending the ping from, let's use blue here. We're sending the ping from that loopback to the other loopback. Whoa. And we want the reply to come all the way back to the loopback over here. So let's predict what's going to happen. First, show IP route. Do we have a way of getting to all eights? We have a way of getting to all eights right there. So if we have a way of getting to all eights, it will exit our interface. So at least we can we can chuck this guy out. If we do a debug IP packet, you'll see that if I ping all eights, source loopback zero. Oh yeah, we have that default route. <laughs> we have that default route we did on R2. Okay. So here it works because we have the default route coming back but let's take that default route out. Let's go to R2. Just hit the up arrow, control A to go to the beginning of the line and type in no in space. So kill that, kill that default route. And now ping 8888 source loop back zero now it will die. And we'll wait for those pings to complete and you should see that. Got five sets of these right there. Let's see what it says. It says you're coming from source 7777 destination all eights routed via the fib so your routing table knows about it 
it chucked it down to the interface and it sent it out the interface. The keyword you are looking for here is this guy, the word sending. Sending means you chucked it out of fast zero zero. Let's take a look at what happened on R2. Debug IP packet. Debug IP packet. Go back to R1. Hit the up arrow. And let's take a look at how it looks on R2 side. R2, you can already see that you've got a special word in there. What is that word that you see that gives you a clue of what's happening? Yes, it is unroutable, meaning that uh, in our show IP route, we have no clue of how to get back to all sevens. I could fix this a whole bunch of ways with uh, with IP route statements. I could. We, you already know that the default route works. What would be the most specific way of getting to all sevens? the most specific way of getting this ping to work. Yep, but uh, how would I write that static route? IP route, all sevens, all 255s, 10, 10, 12, 1, correct. So we'll try it out. IP route, all sevens, all two five fives, ten, ten, twelve, one. Go back to R1, ping source loop back zero. We have the exclamation marks, pings work, everything works. We have the magic words, sending. Sending is what we're looking for. And we're good. Okay, any questions about what we've seen so far? So these debug commands, they help you out a lot. That debug IP packet, pretty, pretty good command. Okay, so part of uh, CCNA also is troubleshooting CDP, knowing how to turn it on and off. I kind of forgot that step. But uh, what you can do is you can go into the interface, so interface fast zero zero, and you can type in no CDP, and if you do a question mark, no CDP enable, means you're gonna shut it off on this interface. So now it's gone. Now, if you show CDP neighbors, you're going to still have that in there because uh, you've got that hold down time of 180. And if you keep hitting the up arrow, do, 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 right, show CDP neighbors, it's going to get down to, you know, see, 128, 127. So this update happens every 60 seconds and hopefully it gets past 120. There we go. Okay, cool. So when it goes down to all the way to zero, you should see R1 drop off. Sometimes people don't like CDP because it's kind of, uh, might tell you too much information. So you can run CDP on a laptop with certain tools like the Backtrack CD, connect it up to a network and then see a bunch of IP addresses and you know switch information and ports and all that stuff. So CDP doesn't tell you routes to neighbors. CDP just tells you IP addresses and neighbor capabilities. It doesn't tell you about routes. But when you get to CCIE, there is something called ODR, which uses CDP to tell a default route to, 
to someone. But uh, you don't need to worry about that because no one uses that anymore. Yeah, so Christopher has a, a good comment. So it's definitely not good to run CDP on interfaces connected to equipment you do not manage. Yep, that's a good point. So here's what here's what he means by that. So let's say you work in a uh, environment, multi-vendor environment like ISP or something like that, and you own this router. So this is this is you. You're connected up to a router, and this is uh, the NSA. I don't know why you would have routers connected to the NSA, but, you know. Oh, actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got, uh, okay, all right. So if you work for Verizon, you have, a, you have a router connected to the NSA. You don't want to run CDP on your link here, because that would just be a bad move because all the NSA has to do is turn on CDP and then he sees uh, your he'll see your IP address he'll see the router information all that stuff now CDP is a very trusting protocol you can get a CDP spoofer I believe CDP spoofing yeah Yeah, I forgot the program that actually does that, but what you could do is if you hook up a laptop with the a backtrack CD, you could spoof CDP and you could actually send weird messages to, you know, you said like, oh, oh, the router is a 666 router, or, you know, you can send weird stuff. It's got like an IP address of uh, 999999 and it actually doesn't have that. So no CDP enable turns it off on the interface level. And if you want to turn it off globally, it's no CDP run, which is really, really stupid because you have to remember that C CDP run is on the whole router and CDP enables on the interface. So no CDP run here. This means that everything, every interface, CDP is not going to run. Yep. Now, can you think of the troubleshooting stuff that they could throw at you on this? They could tell you that, oh, you've got these four routers, find the IP addresses on all of them using CDP, and one of the routers isn't working, it's not giving you an IP address. Well, it could be CDP is not on on that interface, and they just didn't tell you. So to troubleshoot that, if you're at R2, and they're moving a lot of equipment around, sounds like a freight train. So if you want to look at the running config of that interface, because you don't want to always do show run all the time. It's just a newbie thing. The only reason, if you're an expert, the only reason you would do show run is you're gaining time to think. And you're trying to look at it as a badass because you're hitting space and whoever's looking over your shoulder is going, wow, he could read that fast. But all you're doing is you don't know the answer yet and you're just stalling for time. So the best way to do this is show run interface and the particular interface you want to look at. So show run interface fast zero zero gives you that particular interface. And so as a troubleshooting step, if CDP, if you weren't getting CDP on that interface, you'd be looking for these magic words, no CDP enable. A couple other ways you could do, at least one other way I, I would think of is you would just do the stupid check. So show run pipe I so give me the whole config and just look for the word CDP. And then you would see that, oh, I have multiple problems here. Right, so troubleshooting is, a, is much more involved in the new CCNA test. I've seen previews of it and, uh, you know, they're not going to tell you 
run CDP, like start CDP here, because they they assume you they they assume you know how to do that. They're gonna throw it at you in a different way, involving some troubleshooting. Uh, I don't know when the old one expires. I know they're already selling the the new books, so the new books are already out on Amazon. And uh, we'll we'll have a uh, we'll have a little discussion about what the new test entails. But they took out RIP, which is good and bad. It's it's good because no one uses RIP, but it's bad because RIP was kind of the protocol to learn that helps you learn about other protocols. It's kind of like an easy introduction. Uh, they put in multiple area OSPF, so they drop things from CCNP into CCNA. So multiple area OSPF and uh, a lot more IPv6. They took out the wireless, which was good because it's like, dude, you know, why, why, why put in wireless? Why put in that filler for CCNA? So multi-area OSPF in CCNA, but it's not, it's not really that, that difficult. Not anymore. New CCNA, multi, multi-area. Okay, so I showed you how to turn on and turn off CDP. That's not a big deal. Uh, static routing. We figured out that if you do static uh, default routes point to each other, we have loops. Another thing you can run into is this. So let's say we're doing the static route. And instead of pointing to dot one, which is kind of where you want it to point to, you point it to something funky. Right. You you foobar you you fat finger the 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 IP address. Well, this this is going to fail because it's going to send it to the wrong IP. So as part of your troubleshooting, be on the lookout for you know when they say like they love these type of questions where. The internet was working fine before a tech came in. He had just passed his MCSE. Somehow you let him on the routers. Internet don't work anymore. Well, why is that? Well, it could be something as simple as everything's fine, but one IP address on that default route going out is screwed up. Could be very, very simple. It could be the interface is shut down. You know, stuff like that. Okay. Now let's see what else we can show you. That's pretty much it for now because we're coming up on the hour and 20 mark. Let's do something fun. So instead of typing in show IP route all the time, Kind of, a, kind of a pain in the ass. What you want to do is we want to make an alias so that if I type in SIR, I'll get that. So alias exec, alias exec, and then SIR. So that's our shortcut, and that will do show IP route. And now if I type in sir, boom, show IP route. Now we can we can even get uh, more crazy. Show IP route pipe I capital S. We can do something like that, and uh, we might as well just go all out on that one. So hit the up arrow, alias exec sir show IP route static. So you could do SIRS, so show IP route static, SIRE, show IP route EIGRP, SIRO, show IP route OSPF, you know, have different ones. So now if I do SIRS, I just get nice clean output of my single static route there. All right. Another little trick that I want to show you, not really a trick, but this is what I do in production. 
So if you go into one of your interface, interface faster of zero, logging event link status. So if you want to know when a link has gone up or down, I throw this on every every link, logging event link status on my core stuff, not not on my edges. I don't really worry about that, but in my core logging event link status, turn this on and then it will save when links have gone up or down. That way you could find out like, you know, you have other techs working, other engineers, and they screw things up, and you could actually point to the log and say, oh, where? You know, at 9 o'clock, 9.15, that link went down. So either the thing was rebooted or uh, someone pulled the cable. You know, it could be a bunch of different reasons. And to actually send this crap to the log. So right now you've been seeing things scroll in front of you. Your log is show log but nothing's there because you're not actually sending it to the buffer. So to turn it on, it's logging buffered. Just some basic stuff. And now when that link status goes up or down, it will also save it to the log so that you can look at it later. Uh, also, another reason I'm showing you this stuff is not just for kicks. But it's also because in the new CCNA, there's a lot more logging SNMP. Um, there's going to be a lot more buffer. There's, you know, basically SNMP is the big one because they wanted CCNAs to be almost admin-like. They didn't want CCNPs anymore. They had no clue how to do SNMP. They're aiming the C or they're aiming for the CCNA guys. I was saying CCNP, but uh, they want the CCNA guys to be really, really on the ball now. All right. So before we leave, I just want to end with if you go on router one. show IP route. So notice for us to get to different places, we're manually typing all this crap in. Oh, not that one. All eights, all nines. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of uh, IP route. They're static, which means if that link dies, uh, you know, it, it's not going to change. It's not going to fail over to a different path, but it's, it's easy. But it doesn't change. It's not resilient enough. So not ne maybe next week. Next week, we're going to learn about a routing protocol. I think we'll do OSPF. That's going to learn about your links automatically, and it's going to fail over if things happen. So dynamic routing protocol, they learn things automatically, and it figures a way around it. So. The question Festus has is static default doesn't do that correct because right here you've got router one default route sending stuff it doesn't know about to router two. What happens if that link dies? So the link between router one and router two just died, right? A gerbil just chewed through the cable. It's, yeah, it's, it's down, right? The NSA guy went up to your cable. He was installing a tap. He's the new guy. He's the intern. And he did the tap wrong. He actually cut the cable, right? Cable's dead, right? Your router still has that default route out there. You didn't select anything else, so your link is now totally screwed. With a dynamic routing protocol, you can fail around it. Now you could you could ghetto something up. You could you could do this, right? You could make two default routes using different what we call administrative distances. So 
I won't explain it too much, but if we do this, show we do IP route all zeros, all zeros, 10, 10, 12, 2, then you do a question mark. You've got a number that you could type in. This is known as the administrative distance. Okay, so let's type in 10. So we typed in 10 right there. If I show IP route, it's not going to, nothing here is going to look any different. Right. Okay, so we have a we have a 10 right there. Still the next hop. Now if I show run, let's show you what the run says. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right, because you'll see that my next hop, my router looked at me and says, what the hell are you doing? You're saying you wanted a second default route but you pointed it to the same next hop. So it's going to go, what the heck? So it's not going to do that. It just replaced it. But if we did this, IP route, all zeros, all zeros. Let's say you had another interface out there, 1010. This is going to be in the future. 1010.13.3. And you say this is 20. Show run. There we go. So now it looks a little bit different. So now you see two default routes. It's going to use the one with the lower administrative distance first. It's a distance of 10. If that link dies, like physically dies, then we're going to send to 13.3 because it's next in the line. Now, physically dies in this case means a down state. It's looking for the, for the link to go down. You can have cases here where you're still technically down, like packets don't go all the way over, but your side is still up. And the way this would work is this. You've got a switch here. So if you have a switch here, it could be a cheapo switch like a Belkin or something like that. So if you have a switch here, will this link ever go down? So if this side dies, this side will still be up, right? It's only if this middle guy dies that both sides will go down. So in the case right here where you have a switch in the middle, some device in the middle, they're pretty much always going to be up no matter what happens on the other end. So the static route, multiple static routes with uh, administrative distance, not exactly the best thing to do because it's relying on that interface going into a down state. Okay. Any questions before we sign off? Yeah, you could do a put a do in front of that. Who's played with iOS uh, 15? I'm not sure if it needs a do anymore, but. Yeah, you might want to see if they, uh, they got rid of that requirement if you're in global config. Okay. So that's good. So we're going to sign off here. Thanks for showing up and uh, going to be rendering this out and uploading it for everyone. Uh, if you want to watch it again, 
and for the people who did not show up. So thanks for attending, and I will see you guys later.